Good evening. My name is Ali Aragi. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon at the Core Institute, and I'm the director of the spine division. I want to thank you for spending your time listening to my talk this, this evening. And I want to let you know that there's a few slides, not many, but a few slides that have some gory pictures. So I hope uh, the pictures won't bother anybody. Um, and uh, basically what I'm going to talk to you about is how things have changed, not just in the last decade, but since I've been in practice, which is now 25 years, and how much spine surgery has come along. And I'm just going to highlight a few things that have really, in my mind, been a revolution in spinal surgery and has enabled me to either care for patients that I wasn't able to care for 20 years ago, or that has really changed the care of these patients and be able to deliver better care more efficiently and safely. But to start, I just want to go over with you a little bit about this, since a lot of this talk about is about treatment of degenerative conditions. And if you look on the right side, you can see a bunch of pictures with stage Roman numerals one, two, through, through five. And it basically shows a progression of a disc degeneration. And if you see, for example, in, in slide number three, the back is starting to bulge. This disc, which is nice and smooth in picture number one, is now getting all these lamellae and turns, tears in them. And you can see that the height of the disc begins to decrease. And in here, it's collapsed. And there's no more disc material left. So by the same token, this is a CAT scan of a patient. And we're looking at a cut going, it's called an axial cut, which goes across the body. The front is here and the back is here. These little joints in here are called the facet joints. And these facet joints in this study are, is a nice, healthy facet joint. You've got space in between them. There's no big bone spurs. This is your main sac where the nerves are sitting in. And if you look, they start degenerating. You first start getting tears in the outer covering of the disc. And then as this collapses down, because that disc, like in that picture number five that I showed you, does collapse down, the back part, which is the facet joints, also collapse down. And when they collapse down, there's extra pressure on them, and they start degenerating. And they look like this. See how narrow this is, and you've got this bone spur here? And see how the nerve is now more triangular shaped rather than circular shaped. And then you come to here, it is really down to a pinpoint. This is spinal stenosis. When you hear you have spinal stenosis, that's what it is. It's the progression of the nerve getting smaller and getting to this small little form. So enough about that. Let's talk about some of the new minimally invasive techniques that are on the horizon. Well, I have news for you. We are on the horizon. It's here. And it's getting better every day. So the first thing I want to talk to you about sacroiliac joint fusions. Sacroiliac joint pain was something that when I see a patient 20 years ago, I'd say, okay, we'll send you for some physical therapy, here's some medications, and then they wouldn't get better, for example, and I would send them for injections. But after the injection was done, I tell them, look, the only surgery we have to fuse the sacroiliac joint is a very big operation that we never do it for pain. We only do it for tumors or fractures and that kind of stuff. But when you really look at the sacroiliac joint, which is the joint right here, by the way, it's where your pelvis comes around and meets the back of your spine. Approximately 15% of back pain is from the sacroiliac joint or has some contribution from the sacroiliac joint. So it's not really rare. It's just the problem is we had no good way of treating it. So our treatment has been for sacroiliac joint physical therapy, anti-inflammatory medications, muscle relaxants, pelvic belts, which really, unless the patient just had a pregnancy, it really doesn't work, um, sacroiliac joint injections, and then there are some other things out there which I don't prescribe because I don't find them work too well for true sacroiliac joint problems, such as prolotherapy and uh, neurostimulation. Sometimes radiofrequency ablation works, but basically the way it's done is when you have a patient that has sacro sacroiliac joint problems, and on this x-ray you can see the front of a patient, this is the pelvis coming around, this is the hip, and there's the other hip. As the pelvis comes around and meets the tailbone, which is here, this triangular shaped bone, 
The joint is this space in here. It's that faint line in here, and the other one is here. This picture here is showing the left side that we have coned in on, and this black thing is actually the tip of a needle that goes into the joint. So, the way we can figure out if a sacroiliac joint is the actual pain generator or not is not by MRI. Sometimes the CT scan changes or MRI changes, but the vast majority of the time, we have our pain management colleagues put a needle into the joint and inject it with numbing medication. And if the numbing medication takes your pain away for a short period of time, then it's probably a sacroiliac joint. And then after that, we will go ahead with steroid injections and see how much relief that gives them. Sacroiliac joint fusions have nowadays become a technique that we do through a small incision about this big. It gets done within an hour. Um, there's many different techniques for it. The technique that I like to use, we actually pack bone graft into the joint and we place this device that you can see that's rotating like a propeller of a plane. This device is actually inside the joint through an incision where this tube goes in from here to here. And what this is doing is called in medical terms decortication, which means it takes out the cartilage in the joint and creates a space in there so that the two ends of the bone will actually contact each other. Normally, between the two ends of the bone, there's a cartilage. It's kind of like if you ever have chicken wings and break the wing apart, there's a shiny white surface. That's the cartilage. It's called articular cartilage. This is the same thing. We've got to take that cartilage off for the two ends of the bone to be able to fuse together. That's what a fusion is. So we need to clean that out, pack bone in there, and then put some fixation across it. So that's what the device that actually cleans the bone. And then here is the, that same device, the tube that I showed you, which I showed you before. This is that same tube. Just we took out the instrument that was cleaning this space and created a cavity. Now we pack bone graft in there and that's where the bone graft goes. This is the sacrum. This is the ilium called the sacroiliac joint. And you can see the bottom of the joint is here. It still continues. We are just packing this with this bone graft that you can see going into the joint to fuse it. So now that we have the ends of the bone clean from the cartilage, we packed it with bone. We can't leave it moving because if it moves, it is never going to heal. So we have to do something to get it to heal. So in those situations, that's when we put these implants across the joint and they come in two different sizes. We have decorticated and packed bone graft around the main implant, which holds everything together. And this is just a second screw to prevent the rotation of the pelvis as it moves. And I, and I know some of this may not be clear, but it's very hard to explain all this in, in, in a limited amount of time. But so basically, nowadays, we can fuse the sacroiliac joint, and we're just recently publishing a paper on our two-year data of 200 patients that we have very good fusion rates, and the patients have done very well. That's not to say it's for everybody, and it's not gonna work for everybody, but the vast majority of patients get better when they have sacroiliac joint problems. Now, the reason we don't go fusing everybody is because a lot of people will just get better with simple stuff like anti-inflammatory medications, physical therapy, injections, but those who fail, now there's actually hope for it, where 15 years ago, there really wasn't. What about navigation? So it's kind of like if you would imagine the navigation in your car where you would look at a map and then look at what street you're on, which direction you're going in, and then you would figure out how, where to go and plan yourself a route. In surgery, when we do surgery without navigation, we do have an x-ray that helps us, but we basically have to look at the bony anatomy, figure out where we are, and then where we need to put our screws and rods and everything else. And within a very short distance away are the nerves, for example, or major blood vessels in your body that can get harmed. Having said that, for many, many years, all of us did this without navigation, and still many centers are doing it without navigation. It doesn't mean it cannot be done without navigation. What it means is it's yet another tool in your toolbox to help you get what you need done potentially more accurately, potentially more quickly. And 
also it's enabled us to get into bony corridors that otherwise would be dangerous to get into because they were so tight. Now with navigation, we can do it. So how does navigation work? Well, back in, the, actually I found this slide when I was preparing for this for two thousand, from 2013. Um, actually, excuse me, 2006. We were doing a cadaver lab and you can see me on the left, I had hair and everything else, all the good stuff. This is a cadaver lab that we were working on, this navigation system with GE Healthcare in making, doing prototypes and doing the work on cadavers to see if it works, how accurate it is, and is it something that's feasible. Um, you can see all these big tools and extensions that we had to get these in, and this is the fluoroscope that we were talking about. So we were basically doing the navigation and then check to see how accurate the navigation was with the fluoroscopy machine. And you can see in this picture here, we have an incision. This is probably about two inches, an inch and a half, two inches. And we have these towers that are sticking out of the patient's back. And this is what it is. These towers are going into screws that are going into bone, in, in the bone of the patient. And we were able to put these without seeing any of the bony anatomy because we had the navigation system in there. And then through that navigation system, we could put these wires in that once we put the wire in there, then we could put a screw that had a hole in the middle over the wire into the patient, knowing exactly where it's gonna go. So this is all new technology, and this is what the screen for the navigation would look like. So this is the screws that we put in with navigation, and here is us mapping a plan for the next screw where to go. So Basically, we would take an instrument and put it on the skin or inside on the bone, and as we would move it around, this line would move around until we adjusted it back and forth till we saw exactly where, where we wanted to go and get in the right spot. Then once we did that, we could actually adjust the length to guesstimate, or not even guesstimate, estimate very accurately how far deep we have to go before we come out of the bone. So this would enable us to determine the length of the screw, the width of the screw, and exactly where to put the screw to avoid the nerve. This was all seen on a computer screen, and as you can see, all these little dials here would adjust the contrast on the screen, change the length, the width, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's basically making surgery a lot more accurate, easy, and reproducible. So, what about doing minimally invasive fusions? And I put it here from the backside because there's many different ways to do a minimally invasive fusion. So, what's good about minimally invasive fu fusions when we know that we used to do big midline incisions and go in there and perform a good job fusing the spine, and they worked, they, they truly did. The, the difference is that nowadays we can do it with smaller incisions, less blood loss, lower infection rates, and these, these first three are proven unequivocally in the literature. And we also feel that the patients will have less pain. Now, long-term results are probably about the same. When you look at patients a year out and two years out, open versus minimally invasive surgery, they're probably doing about the same. But certainly those first few months are much easier. So what this has enabled me to do is as our population ages, and while when I first got into practice, if I had a 70-year-old, that was old. Today, I do 85-year-olds who are healthy without being as concerned about it. One of the reasons is minimally invasive surgery. The other reasons is obviously our cardiologists and our healthcare has gotten so much better, and our anesthesia has gotten so much better, et cetera, et cetera. But definitely being able to deliver surgery with less infections, less blood loss, less stress on the body, smaller incisions, has enabled me to operate on people that 15 years ago I would have said, you know, uh, there is a way to do this, but I honestly don't think you'll make it through the surgery. So this is really, really nice. Basically, what the premise is we make a, a small incision in the skin, and rather than make a midline incision and pull all the muscles to the side to get to where I need to be, I go directly over it using navigation or regular fluoroscopy C-arm, make a small incision, 
And then what we do is we put these dilators in. So if you look on this picture, there was only one, one metal thing going in. And then there's more of these that go over them to dilate and push that muscle out of the way without cutting it and creating a larger opening. And this one, this dilator is probably around 18 or 22 millimeters wide. And then once I do that, I could take all the inside ones out and just put a tube that comes right to the skin and is hollow in the middle. Then through that skin, I can do whatever I want. Excuse me, through that opening, I can do whatever I want, and I'm going to show you. So this, for example, the last dilator. And this is what it looks like when the dilator goes in. It's splitting the muscle, and there's an x-ray showing the first dilator going in. This is the patient with their back here, their face is down the bottom, and these are the discs, these are the vertebrae, right? So I'm showing you what this looks like. Then when I put my second dilator, it goes over it. And again, what I'm doing is I'm splitting these muscles and pushing them out of the way rather than cutting them. And again, I can do the same thing and get it further open to the depth that I want. And this tells you, for example, this patient is 60 millimeters deep. So if I replace all these long, cumbersome things with a 60 millimeter tube over it and take these out, I, also, I all of a sudden have an opening inside that I can look through. And then, when w that's the tube that we talked about. And then there's an arm, oops. There's an arm that holds that tube in place for me so it doesn't wiggle all over the place. And I can change the angle depending on what I want to see, as if I was looking through a peephole, all the different structures that I want to see. This is the difference when you're doing this. This is the traditional technique where you're coming in midline you're cutting the middle, that's the middle, this is called the spinous process, this is those facet joints that I showed you earlier, this is the back of the patient, the front of the patient is somewhere down in here, and then I took all the muscle here, I swept it out of the way, see this muscle here? This is the opposite side, I swept it out of the way, and I'm holding it out of the way with this retractor blade. Nothing wrong with this technique, this technique works, it worked well for many years. However, now I can go to the picture on the right and insert this tube, leave the insertion of the muscles to this bone, which is, which is important, in place and not cut it, and just split the muscles out of the way. And when we look at the CAT scan on these patients, you can see that this side barely has any scar tissue left. The tissue is stuck to the bone very nicely, where here it hasn't stuck as well. And again, same thing on this side versus in comparison to this side. So the point is that it's helpful for recuperation and muscle um, viability and, and less what we call fibrosis of the muscle, which is what happens to muscle when you cut it and retract it too much. <coughs> there was another technique which is now a little bit fallen out of favor, but it's, it's a very interesting concept in that you had a funnel. You would put this in closed, and then you put a thing in there and you cranked it open and the funnel would open up and would let you see a lot through that same incision. So I used to do the analogy of swimming on the water. You jump into the pool and then you, can, you get under the water and you can go wherever you want to go. And this was another type of retractor that we used for a number of years. And we just found out that all the extra cumbersome parts weren't necessary and you could do it through a regular tube. But there are still some people who will use this. The other thing is, when I come down straight, like I showed you earlier, I can work here. But I cannot get to here. And usually what we would do is we would open up the skin here, pull the muscle out to both sides so I could go to this side and I could go to the other side. Well, with this technique, once I'm done with here, I can do what's called wanding, which means just change the angle, and this soft tissue does move, bring it over, and then work at this angle and undercut the bone here and this nerve that is getting pinched, I could free it on this side, I could free it on that side. If there's a herniated disc which would be sitting here, I could move it to the side and pull it all out, all through a tiny little incision. Um, so this is another advantage of this technique. Now, this is what it would look like under a microscope and this is obviously an artist's rendition, but this is where we have shaved the bone off through that same tube here is the nerve that goes down to, to, to the other levels, and here's the nerve that's exiting, which is called the nerve root, 
and goes to the legs. So if there's a, this blue thing, let's say it's a herniated disc under it, I can get in through here, remove the bone, clean it off, and then take that blue piece out. Um, you, it's kind of hard to look at this because you need magnification um, with your bare naked eye, but you could use these loops, which I'm sure you've seen in, in some of these uh, medical shows, or we could use a microscope, which is really nice, and, and that's what I like to use, and be able to see everything very, very clearly. This is an actual picture of, from within a microscope. That's the nerve that's getting retracted over, and that's the disc underneath it. This picture here is a piece of disc that the artist has drawn out, that's, that's drawn, that's coming out right from this opening in here. And here's the actual picture off of a microscope, from pulling it out from under the nerve. This is a piece of disc. This is it again here. There are, you can actually put in spacers between the vertebrae, and this is a little bit of a fancy re retractor that actually expands in different directions. And you can put this in, and then go into the disc, clean out this disc completely from the back side that we're going in. This is, again, the patient's front, that's the patient's back. We're looking at the patient from the side. And I can clean it out, put this distractor in, and then when I turn it 90 degrees, it jacks it open. You can see that clearly this is much wider than here. Whoop. So basically, I can open it up, clean out the inside of the disc, pack bone in here, pack a spacer in there that will hold it apart so it doesn't collapse back down, all through that same incision, through the, through the same tube. So this is typically what we use for this procedure, a 22 millimeter tube. So it's just under an inch. Your incision is probably right around an inch. And this is a, a young lady that I operated on many years ago. And you can, you can see the size of the incision. This is a quarter on her back. So the incisions are really not big. And you can do a lot of work in there. This lady has four screws in her back and that spacer that I showed you and cadaver bone through, the, through those two incisions, one on either side. Now, the other one is a lateral interbody fusion. Lateral means from the side. So we're actually going in from the side. And this is the one that has a couple gory pictures. This is a kid who had minimally invasive surgery for scoliosis on the right. And this is another kid who had the older technique this is the kind of incision we'd have to make to put in hardware. And this is what that hardware would look like. This patient had these type of incisions, had three or four incisions, and this is where they took the bone graft from, to do the same operation. So you can see the significant difference in the amount of incision, skin trauma, soft tissue trauma that occurs to the patients using this technique. This is what it would look like. This is an actual picture from, from the incision. You can see it's a big, what we used to call a shark bite incision. Um, and I can do what we used to do through this incision, now through these two incisions. Each one of these is about maybe an inch. And nowadays, we don't even need to make two incisions. We just make one incision and go down and get the same thing done. So again, this is significant improvement in post-operative pain, infection rate, bleeding, incision sizes. And in this type of surgery, it's much faster doing it minimally invasive than open. How does that work? Well, here's a picture in the operating room. There's one incision here. There's a second incision here. This is the spine on its side. And basically, you make an incision, put your finger in here where it's safe, come up here to know where you make that incision, and then you put a device straight onto the spine. And that becomes your tube. You do the same thing with the dilators, and you put your tube down, and you do the surgery through it. Then we have this fancy neuromonitoring system because there are nerves that travel in the, in the side of the spine, and we don't want to injure them. And the patient's under anesthesia, so they can't tell you that you're putting the instruments on my nerves. So this, what they actually do is they connect leads to the extremities, lower extremities, 
And then when I'm in there with, a, with my dilators, I will do very light electrical stimulation. And depending on at what level of electricity this stimulates at, we know how far or how close we are to a nerve. The other thing is I can turn that stimulator around and I can figure out is the nerve behind my retractor, is it in front of the retractor, where is it? So these are all very new technologies, new meaning in the last 15 years, 10 to 15 years, that enable us to go in there without looking for the nerve and doing it. Because if you want to look for the nerve, you're going to have to make a big incision to see it. So that's the, those, these are the advantages of, of this technique. Last but not least, and I didn't want to talk too much about this because my last talk was about kyphoplasty, but um, don't forget kyphoplasty. Kyphoplasty is a technique that we use for compression fractures, only for compression fractures. Um, and the compression fracture has to be new. Last time I gave this talk, I had patients coming in and saying, I broke my back 10 years ago, now can you put the cement in? And no, I can't because the fracture's healed. So it's important to understand these are for new compression fractures. But what's a compression fracture? A compression fracture is this. We are looking at a patient's spine from the side again. Here's the patient's front. The patient's back is, is over here. A vertebra should look like a box, like this, okay? And those nerves that we looked at earlier are in the back here. See how this is not looking like a box? It looks like a wedge. It actually looks like a ski slope here. That's because this is broken. This one is also broken, but it's white because we have injected it in the past with cement. There's also, in this, possibly a fracture down, right down in here. But if you look, this is significantly narrowed, right? But now look at this picture. This is after it got cemented. You can see it's much taller. The reason is this. If you get to the fracture early enough, what you can do is through this bony corridor in here, which is called the pedicle, you can insert a balloon. And it's, it's an actual balloon. Now, it's a very fancy medical balloon. We put that inside. We put it all the way to the front in here. And once I have it in the right place, I start turning this handle, which pushes dye into it, and it starts inflating it. The reason we put dye is because we want to see where the balloon is going, and we want to make sure it's not going into the wrong place. But if it's a fresh enough fracture, you can actually inflate it and put cement in there. So you inflate it, it opens up back to its normal height, or even a little bit more than it is now, and maybe not all the way to its normal height. And then you pack it with cement. And once you pack it with cement, 10 minutes later, the cement is hard and it ain't going anywhere. What's the advantage? Well, look at this. In this picture, if you look at this spine here, and then you look at this spine here, it's like this. But if you look at this picture on here, you will see that because we corrected this deformity and straightened it out, the patient's back is a lot less curved than it was on the picture on the left. So what does that mean? We have a lot of people who are elderly and they have multiple of these fractures, they have osteoporosis, and they're walking as like a hunchback. Well, if you catch it early enough, you can correct it and you can also help the pain. This is kind of the, the picture that they talk about. This is the same lady, not really, but it's a depiction of the same lady who's probably 40 years old and as they go to 60 and 70. And part of this is because of these osteoporotic fractures. So honestly, more important than treating the osteoporotic fracture is preventing it. So please, if you're over 40 years old, you're postmenopausal, which means you're not having your periods anymore, you're at risk for having osteoporosis. Go to your medical doctor, get a bone density test, and get treated for it. Take your vitamin D, take your calcium, whatever your doctor says is the right thing. We do have a bone health specialist at the Core Institute, which is, this gentleman's a rheumatologist, and all he does every day, night and day, is osteoporosis. He doesn't do anything else other than osteoporosis. It's an exciting life, but he treats a lot of people, helps a tremendous number of my patients. Your primary care doctor can help you, but just seek care so you don't need the kyphoplasty. And if you have a fracture, let's get you in sooner than later to take a look at it and see if you're a candidate. And if you do that right, then you can grow up to be like her and still be able to do your splits. All right, so 
at this point, um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer you. I hope that I haven't bored you too much. So it depends what you're having dry needling for. If you have a painful area in your back, if you have a muscle spasm, if you have tendonitis, dry needling can certainly help. But dry needling is not going to solve the problem of a herniated disc or a spinal stenosis or a fracture. So I certainly think, like almost every other modality that is being used today in back pain treatment, it has its own place. It's kind of like people ask me about acupuncture, it's the same thing. For certain things, acupuncture can be helpful. Dry needling, the same thing. But if you're not seeing improvement with anything after five, six sessions of treatment, and it's not going anywhere, probably a 26th session is not going to help you. But yes, I, I am not opposed to that for the right conditions. Yeah, so uh, great question. In general, um, there's only a certain amount of steroids that you can get in a year because your body metabolizes the steroids and it affects certain glands in your body and it can create issues with the function of those glands. So typically we say three doses, and some people will say four doses of steroids. But if you already had two epidural injections, that's two out of the four that you, or out of the three that you already used. So it becomes a little tricky. That's why for me, if I'm not sure if somebody has a sacroiliac joint problem, I won't send them for a sacroiliac joint steroid injection. I will send them for what's called a diagnostic injection, which is with numbing medication only, so I'm not using one of their coupons for the steroid injections for the year. I have them do that, and if they come back and they go, oh yeah, for a few hours, that joint was awesome, then I will send them for the steroid injection. If their exam is very clearly a positive uh, sacroiliac joint pain, sure, I don't want to torture them with, with needle injections. I'll just send them for the steroids. So keep in mind, no matter which part of your body it is, whether it's your shoulder or, or your tennis elbow or epidurals or your SI joint, which is a sacroiliac joint, three to four injections is the max in a year. Um, again, I, there, there's a lot of changes, right? I only had time to go over a few of them, which I thought were some of the most uh, beneficial ones and the ones that are truly proven to work. Um, robotics is another one that I think is going to work for sure, um, but it's not available as much. It has a little bit of a navigation, not a tremendous amount of spine surgery yet, but they're going to come up with applications for it that's it will also revolutionize certain parts of spine surgery. Um, and that's probably we didn't get to talk about. The other thing that we didn't talk, talk about is artificial disc replacement, especially in the neck. In the lower back it works, but the appropriate patient to use for an artificial disc in the lower back is a very limited number of patients. In the neck, you have a larger population that it's reasonable to use the artificial disc for. Again, not everybody's a candidate for the artificial disc. Some patients are much better off with the older fusion technique than the artificial disc. That's why probably today um, in, in my practice, a lot of patients get fusions. Every now and then, I will have a good candidate for artificial disc replacement. And I have been involved with the FDA studies for the initial versions of the artificial discs that, have, that were approved in the United States, both for lumbar and cervical. So I've been doing it for about, uh, I want to say 12 to 13, 14 years. So um, it's a really good technology, again, for the right patient. It's like the dry needling. It's not right for everybody, but for certain patients it's right. It's picking and choosing what's wrong and what's the best treatment for that patient. So that's a broad question that's harder to really answer accurately. However, I'll give you some guidelines. Generally speaking, if you haven't had any conservative treatment, non-operative treatment, meaning physical therapy, medications, injections, and you have no neurologic deficits that you feel you do, and I'm going to tell you what that is. A neurologic deficit is if not a part of your body is numb or if you don't have weakness in, a, in something, let's say you cannot lift the arm anymore, 
or your foot doesn't slap down as you walk, or you're not tripping on your toe when you're trying to go up steps because your foot is weak. So if you don't have motor weakness, which is strength weakness, if you don't have significant numbness, you could have some tingling, but by numbness, I mean you touch your finger and your finger is numb. If, if you have those things, I think you're probably better off seeing a surgeon because there's a better chance that you, mean, you may need surgery sooner than later. But the vast majority of these situations are not that. And I think pain management is very helpful and can help the right patient. Now, am I suggesting that you take narcotics for a long time? No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about finding out what's wrong, treating it, and after a few injections, if you're not better, well, they're not onto the right thing, you need to move along. Not to have 15 injections and then finally say, okay, now go see a surgeon because none of these injections work. So I don't think that's the best approach. But for a lot of things, pain management guys are very, very helpful and they're a good, good partner for us. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna correct a couple of things in the question because I think it's important for everybody else in the audience to understand. It's a bone density not a bone scan. A bone scan is a different test that's done for a different reason. So a bone density should be done every two years and Medicare will pay for it every two years. Um, a bone density does not tell you about osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is a degenerative condition. It tells you about osteoporosis. Um, most people fall into the osteopenia category and the, well, not most people, but a lot of the DEXA scans and the, uh, that come back and I see the results. But it's important to catch you in that osteopenic category and not let you progress to osteoporosis. So appropriate treatment at osteopenia will hopefully help prevent you or slow down the process to get into osteoporosis. Um, I will tell you the biggest thing that I see uh, missed when people come in, they come in with a bone density result that says osteopenia and then you look at their x-ray and they've already had a compression fracture. If you have had an osteoporotic fracture and your bone density says osteopenia, by definition you're osteoporotic. You need to be treated much more aggressively than someone who just has osteopenia and never had a fracture. So um, every two years is a good guideline to go by. Um, so. I will tell you that I've operated on 90 year olds. The 90 year olds I've operated on, they drive themselves into my own office. They're sharp as anything. They know their whole medical history. They live alone or they, they take care of themselves. So what I've noticed, especially the vast majority of my practice in Sun City West, I, I, I am in Scottsdale as well, but I have learned over the years that as, as our population is aging, the number becomes less, of an, less important. It's your physiologic age that makes a difference. So if you're 85 years old, you had a bypass 20 years ago, and then you had a bunch of stents placed, and you're on Coumadin, and you've had a stroke, and you're significantly overweight, and you cannot walk around because you're so debilitated, you're probably not the best candidate for spine surgery. But if you're an 85-year-old who's active, still drives, does their own things, taking a few medications, then you may be a candidate for spine surgery, but also that depends what is the surgery. If you have a compression fracture, which I could get done even under local anesthesia if I had to, and it takes us 12 minutes, 15 minutes to do the procedure, absolutely you're a candidate. But if you have a big scoliosis that you let go for years and years, and now you have a very difficult, tough curve and all that, no, at 85, you're not a candidate for that. So it's a matter of your physiologic age, versus what's wrong. And then that's a balance that we have to balance and we get the help of our, our um, cardiologist friends and, and, and our other colleagues to try to optimize the patient to deliver the best care to them. Yeah, great question. Um, there are a few different imaging modalities that can show you that. Sometimes, if it's very grossly acute and, and, and it's really bad, you can even tell on an x-ray. But in most circumstances, you need advanced imaging. The best one that we use, the most common one that we use is an MRI. The MRI will show what's called edema in there, which means inflammation in the bone. 
If there's inflammation in the bone, then that means it's a recent fracture. Then if the patient has pain on top of that, in that area, then they're a reasonable candidate for the kyphoplasty. That's one modality. But let's say you have a pacemaker or you have a stimulator, you cannot have an MRI. We can get what's called a bone scan. A bone scan will so-called light up, which means they, they inject you um, with a dye that has some very low nuclear capability, and the dye goes to the area which is inflamed, which has the edema. And if that fracture lights up, then that tells you there's increased circulation there, which means there's increased activity there, and it's probably a new fracture. Um, every now and then, and it's very rare, it's probably one out of 20 fractures that I treat, they have what's called a non-union, which means the fracture, rather than heal by itself, takes time to heal and sometimes doesn't heal. So yes, there are patients out there who had the fracture six months ago, nine months ago, and they still have pain, and when you get the MRI, you see that it's not healed, and there's actually what we call fluid, but it's inflammation inside that area still, even though it's nine months later. Typically, most compression fractures heal within six to eight weeks. The problem with it is that when a patient who's already maybe a little bit debilitated gets the fracture and the pain is so severe that they cannot get out of bed and they have to be at bed rest for two to three weeks, that has such detrimental effects that it's worth if they don't get better after, let's say, 10 days, two weeks, and they're still miserable with pain, to inject it with cement and get them up and moving, rather than having them spend another two weeks in bed and four weeks in bed. That has worse detriment. So that's the way we treat them. We try to treat them conservatively first with some pain medications and say, listen, give it a couple weeks. A lot of times the pain significantly subsides. And I have patients that come back after two weeks and they're like, you know, doc, I can live with this. It's not that bad. Well, fine, live with it. Why, why would you want some cement? If you have a big deformity, maybe, but typically, if the pain gets better relatively quickly, we don't operate on them. So I hope I was able to answer your question.